Hey guys, today's a different kind of a day at Life Church. It's really one of my favorite days of the year. Um, and that today is what we call Vision Day. And that once a year, early in the year, we take a look forward as to what we're believing God to do um, in a big way this year at Life Church. And so I'm going to take a little bit of time and talk about some things, uh, some goals for the year. Then we'll take a snapshot at some financial information. And then I'm gonna just going to do a brief uh, about eight to ten minute message at the end. And so today as we talk about our goals for the year, uh, I, I want to talk about them in really three categories. If you were in here in the fall uh, during our Elevate initiative, as we looked forward to some things uh, over the next two years of what God's going to do at Life Church, we talked about those things in really kind of three categories. One was what, what God would do in our own church family. And then secondly, what God would do here in South Reno through us taking next steps on our campus. And then thirdly, how God might use us to make a bigger difference outside of South Reno. And so as I talk to you today about these three different uh, types of goals, it's going to be in, in, in that kind of language or those categories. And so as we talk about what, some things that we want God to do this year in us as our church family, we, there's a ton of things that are going to happen. I could share a ton of smaller things, but there's really one big thing that we're believing God for this year at Life Church that God would do in us. And here's what it is. We're, we are praying that God would, would increase our culture, both of prayer and worship, that, that we would really take next steps, and that we would really become more and more of a praying church and more and more of a passionately worshiping church. And so there's a bunch of ways that's going to happen. Some of it's just going to be the focus of our prayer. Just like the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. We're going to be praying, saying, God, would you help us to really learn more about prayer and also worship and that that would become a dominant part of our culture here. Also, we're going to uh, regularly teach on both prayer and worship. Every time we find ourselves um, between message series, very likely we'll take one or two weeks between each series and talk a little bit about what does the Bible say about both prayer and worship. Worship. We're going to have a handful of worship nights through the year and prayer nights. And, and then in every ministry, from our children's ministry to our setup teams to our, our food teams all, all, through our, to our life groups, we're praying, and maybe God would speak to you about this, that in each of those areas that God would raise up somebody who would really be a champion for prayer and worship in that ministry. So for instance, the people that, that serve the food on Sunday mornings, that they wouldn't just be serving you donuts, but that while they're serving your donuts, they're praying silently that God would protect you from that donut you're about to eat. That they're even praying while they're serving donuts. And that our setup team, that while they're setting up kids' spaces, that while they're setting it up, they're kind of praying, saying, God, would you use this space today where these kids are going to be learning about you? So that kind of a, whatever we do, we'd be looking to increase in this thing of prayer and worship. And so that's our big goal for what God would do in our church family this year. Now, when we talk about our community and making a bigger difference here in South Reno through our campus, let me share with you a few things that, that we're looking for. One is... On April 23rd, we've penciled in that date to celebrate the grand opening of our kids building next door and multi-purpose facility. And so our, our hope, if the weather holds out, is that, uh, which would be a miracle, is that if, our, if the weather holds out that on April the 23rd, we will be in one service in the gym and then afterwards we'll have a ceremonial ribbon cutting and you can take tours of the building and there'll be a big parking lot party and we'll have a great celebration. Now let me just keep it real with you for a minute. For that to happen, we need 20 days of dry in a row, which we've not seen since like July. And so, um, but in all reality, we, the, the inside of the building is coming along, uh, along awesome. But the outside, it's really hard for them to get much done in the mud. For instance, they tried to install the elevator on a, two separate occasions. And so you had this elevator that's being carried by a large a piece of heavy equipment. And both times, the piece of heavy equipment literally sank in the mud like two feet. Had to be towed out. And, and so we need about 10 days for the ground to dry out before they can really do a lot of work outside. And then we need a solid five to 10 days after that for them to get it done. And so... so um, Feel free to pray about that. So, but if we can find 15 to 20 days of dry before April 23rd, we should be able to celebrate our grand opening celebration that day. It's going to be incredible. I, I, I walk the building about once a week. It's so cool how it's coming along. Super excited about that. 
And, and so along those lines, another goal related to making a bigger difference through, through our campus is our target date is May 1st to open our Kids Life Child Development Center, our Monday through Friday infant care and preschool. I want to invite Darcy Arias to the stage. Darcy, come on down. So Darcy is the director uh, of our Kids Life uh, Child Development Center, our, our infant care and our, our preschool. Uh, many of you have know Darcy that for years, Darcy served in a part-time capacity, overseeing our preschool ministry here at Life Church on Sunday mornings. But through the bulk of that time, she was also working full-time as assistant directors or, or director at, at a, a, a couple of different preschools. And so that's her training, that's her undergraduate degree and her experience. And so, but when we, it was time to look for a director, we didn't just want to hire Darcy because we know her and we love her. And, and, uh, but so we interviewed a handful of different candidates and, and, and they were all great, but literally after each person we talked to, we just loved Darcy more. And so Darcy, we are so excited you. that you are the director uh, of our Kids Life Child Development Center. You can check it out at kidsliferino.com. Uh, we're accepting registrations even now. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but before we went live, before we even ever announced that we were accepting registrations, we already had like 26 families mm -hmm. on a waiting list. And so we're yes. super excited about this. Darcy, read us the purpose statement of our Child Development Center. Okay, Kid, Kids Life Child Development Center exists to provide a loving Christian atmosphere while we partner with parents to help children grow and thrive spiritually, academically, socially, and physically. And so our goal really is that we want to be the best um, infant care and preschool in Reno and teach these kids a ton about Jesus. Darcy, talk to us about some of the specifics that you think really are going to set Kids Life apart. Um, well, the first thing that puts Kids Life above and beyond a lot of the other centers in our city is our facility that we're building. Um, through the developing of the preschool layout, construction of the building, and now equipping the classrooms, we've been very purposeful in how we're designing it, and we're really creating um, an, an environment that will help children thrive and learn even more so. A couple of cool things about the facility. I know one is kind of some of the safety features. Talk to us about that. Yes. Well, we know that safety is a priority and one of the first It's a priority things... to parents now. It seemed like with our parents, it wasn't so much a priority. <laughs> the parents now seem to want their kids safe. We care more now. My parents let me play in the street. Yeah. And so keep going. And so in designing and building our classrooms, we've installed video cameras in the play areas as well as the outside perimeter of the building so that we can monitor at all times who's coming and going as well as um, invite parents to view their classrooms. So you could drop off your child at preschool and then you could stalk them via your iPhone all day long. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so... Uh, Okay, so, and then also the, the indoor play area, super cool. Talk to us about that. Yeah, we're, um, we also have a beautifully spaced indoor playground. In addition so, to our outside. In addition to a beautiful outside playground as well. So even in the worst of weather, children can jump, climb, run, and do everything that they need to do to get all their wiggles out. I was talking to a mom the other day that said that her, her preschooler is getting in trouble like every day at school right now, at preschool, because it's... The, because of the, the weather, they can never play outside. So you got this three-year-old boy who's cooped mm -hmm. up inside all day, nowhere to get the energy out, and so he has no choice but to begin shoving other children. <laughs> and so, uh, and yes. so that. But seriously, we're super excited that all year round, whether it's if it's beautiful, we have the outside, we have the great outdoor play areas, but also on a on a wet winter day, mm -hmm. also the indoor. So super yes. cool. Talk to us about some more features. Um, another thing that is. Um putting kids' life above and beyond the other centers is our educational philosophy. Um, we're building a curriculum that's essentially pulling the best philosophies, the top philosophies for early education, and we're not just incorporating the Nevada standards of pre-K and participating in the Nevada Silver State Stars, which is a quality rating and improvement system, but we're also participating in the National Association for the Education of Young Children. And um, we're, gonna, we're developing a curriculum that is emergent and immersive for your children so we can really help them learn in areas that they're most interested in. We can help them in the developmental areas that they need the most work in. And, um, and it's going to be all around 
wonderful for each individual child. Okay, so we got facility, we got curriculum. Give us one more nugget. Um, the third thing, which I would say is the best, is the atmosphere that we get to have at Kids Life. We are Life Church, and Kids Life is a ministry of Life Church, and so we um, get to incorporate faith and Jesus into every aspect of our school and every day with the children. And the staff that we're building is from our church body, and we're essentially going to be a family. It's awesome. So, yeah, it's wonderful. Darcy, we're so excited to have you leading our school. Let's give it Thank up for Darcy. You. Hey, so as we talk about um, making a bigger difference in South Reno through our campus, the third piece is uh, our goal is that by November the 1st, we will have completed the planning and permitting process to put us in a position to break ground on phase two, which is our 1,200 seat gymatorium, foyer, office space, great lawn. And so um, our hope was initially um, to have a lot of that completed by more like summertime, but between architects and civil engineers and the city and all the construction, everything's just taking a little bit longer for everyone that's doing that sort of thing. And so it's going to probably be some time in the fall before that's complete. And initially we were thinking that we might go ahead and begin moving dirt in the fall. But uh, after our experience of building through this winter, we are are, are thinking seriously about waiting until next spring so we can potentially avoid some of these weather delays. And so, so we are, our hope is that by November the 1st, we'll have all the ducks in a row with planning and permitting. So at the earliest opportunity when weather permits, we can take next steps and break ground on our next phase. Isn't that exciting? And so... Um, Okay, so when we think about making a difference outside of South Reno, let me share with you some of our goals. One is uh, we're going to be launching the Midtown campus of Life Church. We used to talk about that as our northern campus. Uh, most of you have known that we have been... Um, exploring locations inside the McCarran Loop. The McCarran Loop, which goes around our city, inside of there is the most densely populated part of our city. It's the most diverse part of our city. And it's the part of our city with the fewest thriving churches. And so we've been looking throughout that McCarran Loop saying, God, where do you want us to be? Where do you want us to end up? And so over these last couple of months, we have, have targeted an area that, uh, and we've begun a, a, um, negotiations with a landlord um, inside the Midtown area, right? Right off of Virginia. Do many of any of you know where Sushi Pier Two is there at uh, Virginia and Mount Rose Street? And so it's w right in that area. Is and so we currently have a letter of intent with the uh, landlord there that is uh, contingent on our ability to get permitting and um, both for the construction side and the use side with the city. And if all that proceeds, um, then that will end up being where we launch what would be called the Midtown Campus of Life Church. And we're super excited about that. One church, two locations. And I encourage you, if you live north of Moana, then pray seriously about making that um, your, your campus. And other people, God might just call you. Even if you might live down here, God might call you there. But we're, we're really going to encourage folks who live north of Moana to make that where they attend Life Church at our Midtown campus. Super excited for that. Another way we're going to make a difference outside of South Reno is that we're going to be uh, starting a church, building a church in Bolivia that'll house a Compassion International project. Take a look at this video. We plant new churches that intentionally care for children. We know that new church planting remains the single most effective way of reaching people with the good news of Jesus Christ. But what we've discovered over the past several years is that 85% of those who make a decision to follow Jesus do so between the ages of 4 and 14. So when we combine new church planting with intentionally caring for children, we see exponential kingdom results. That's why I love our partnership with Compassion International. What an amazing child advocacy ministry. When we go in, plant the new churches, Compassion, through sponsorships from people like you, sponsors 200 plus children. That church flourishes. I'm so excited about exploring a new partnership that Eastside is beginning with Compassion International and Stadium, where the three of us are going to come together in Mexico in a very unique kind of partnership to establish a church, but also to sponsor children and give them a hope and a future. When we first arrived in Mexico, we visited a site where a child development center had already been in operation for about 10 years. We saw a well-run program 
full of happy children and teens who were loved and cared for. They had strong relationships with Christ and each other. They were self-confident and articulate. They had dreams and goals and wanted to give back to the current generation of children, mentoring and guiding them just as others had done for them. I was blown away by the effectiveness of this model where the local church now is known as a component in that community that cares for families, that cares for their children. And Eastside, we kind of get to lead the way on this one. We're pioneering a new model for the country. One of the most impressive things about what happens in the Compassion Program is that every four minutes, someplace in the world, there's a child accepting Jesus because of what they've learned through their Compassion experience where moms and babies are being cared for, over 80% of those moms become Christ followers because of the love that they receive from their Compassion staff members, because of the difference they see that the church makes in the community. We help them in their spiritual life. We help them in their thought processing, their self-esteem and social skills, and take care of their health needs. It makes a huge difference in the child's perspective and how they look at life. Why would someone who doesn't even know me take an interest in me? That was the biggest impact I ever had in my life, that someone chose me when I was seven years old. This is a real child who's waiting for sponsorship. You have the opportunity to rewrite their future. Every child in the world deserves this. I received Christ here. I crossed the line of faith here. I don't know what I would be like if Christ wasn't in my life. Thank you for sponsoring children all around the world. Your investment makes an eternal difference in the life of a child. Let's make sure that every child has a church. So welcome to the stage, Nathan Hawkins, who's with Stadia and Compassion International. Let's welcome Nathan. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Thank you, Life Church. You guys are doing this. You are helping us to ensure that every child has a church. Nathan, thanks for being here with us. We want to present you with a, a uh, pretend check. Um, wow. And so, uh, I don't know if that's going to fit in my carry-on. <laughs> that's going to be a little tricky to get home. But. Check from Life Church to Compassion and Stadia for $102,000 to build that building. And uh, Praise God. Wow. Thank you, Life Church. Thank you, Life Church. Let me tell you what that's going to go for, all right? That's going to build out a church sanctuary. It's going to build out a kitchen. It's going to build out classrooms, bathrooms, everything that's needed to care for over 200 children in Cochabamba, Bolivia. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, all those kids are going to be served. And moreover, you guys said we're not just satisfied with the church plan. We want to help care for those mothers and babies before the church even gets started. Before the construction is completed, Compassion is sending people out into the community to meet with and serve mothers and babies in their homes so that when the church launches, there will already be a group of people who are excited to participate. This is an amazing partnership. Thank you, guys. Let me show you. This is your pastor, Fernando, and his wife, Rosario. All right? And they're, that's their son. Let me show you the next slide. This is Cochabamba, Bolivia, down in South America. You can see three pins on this map. We have the mother church, the daughter church that you guys are helping to launch, and then Cochabamba for reference. And what God is doing there is phenomenal. And right now, as we speak, children will be registered for the Child Development Center program, and you guys will get to sponsor them. You're first in line. You'll have that opportunity hopefully later this year. Yeah. So construction will be complete. Lord willing, they'll get uh, the drought that you guys are praying for, and it'll be done before yours is. So, wow, way to go. You guys have your priorities in order. And I just say, you're going to hear more about this later today, but I think God is honoring and blessing you for the amazing faithfulness you have. Thank you for partnering with us to ensure that every child has a church. To stay up to date on what God is doing, check out this custom web link that we built just for you guys. It's stadia.cc forward slash life church. Don't do it now. You want to listen to what Pastor Dave has to say. But after the service, check it out and keep up to date on what God's doing. 
Let's thank God for Nathan and Compassion Stadium. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate thank it. You. So then our third piece in terms of wanting to make a bigger difference outside of South Reno than ever is we're praying that this year we'd see more people go on short-term mission trips than any time before in the history of our church. There's a handful referenced in your um, uh, pamphlet there. We're going, Claire and I are planning to um, give leadership to a family mission trip to um, Tijuana, Ensenada, Mexico area, Rancho Agua Viva this summer, mid-July. So maybe you've got kids, maybe like age three and up. It'd be good for that. Or maybe you don't have kids, but it's just kind of for whoever, but includes kids, um, family mission trip down to Mexico, Rancho Agua Viva. That'll be mid-July. There'll be be a trip later in the year to Nicaragua to do water wells. Um, We'll be doing a trip in the fall down to Bolivia. So here's the cool thing. So as Nathan mentioned, we'll be given the first chance to be the sponsors of these kids. I think it's like 39 bucks a month. How much is it? 39? 38, it's a bargain, 38. And so it was 39, but for us it's 38. 38 bucks a month, sponsors a child and make sure their basic needs are met. Access to healthcare, hearing about Jesus, um, food, nutrition, um, education stuff. And so you get to sponsor a child. And so we're going to have a trip in the fall um, after these sponsorships have happened. Listen, about a year and a half ago, I was in Ecuador visiting some of these sites, these compassion sites connected to these church plants. I'd go and I'd visit. We're in Ecuador. And, and all these kids would gather around me and they're all saying the same thing over and over again. And I don't have excellent Spanish. And so they're saying the same thing over and over again. I say to the translator, I say, what are they saying? And they said, he said, they're all asking if you're their sponsor. That's like 30 kids. And I was like, yes, children, I am sponsoring all of you. And so they gave me this epic hug. And and so, no, it was awkward. I was like, no, I'm not your sponsor. But listen, what I found out is it's all these kids' number one dream. Because there was people on that trip who were some kids' sponsors. And it's it's every one of these kids' number one dream to find out who are these, to meet the people that are helping pay for for them to survive and praying for them and writing notes back and forth. And so we're going to send a team this fall. You'll get a chance to meet the kids you're sponsoring. It's going to be incredible. Maybe there's a mission trip that, that, you, that doesn't, maybe your schedule doesn't allow you to go on one of our larger trips, or maybe there's a place you've always wanted to go, like, you know, like Fiji, you know, on the beach, like F- Fiji mission trip on the beach sounds incredible. No, but maybe you have a mission trip you've always wanted to go on, Middle East or a certain part of Europe. And, and so what I'd encourage you to do is Pastor Bill has like a hundred different options where we can have, have small groups, I mean, one, two, three, four of our people jump on board with trips that are already happening in most places around the world. And so if there's a place that's really on your heart or a time frame that say, say, you say, I can go on a trip, but it's this week, there's good odds that Pastor Bill can help you figure that out. And so you can email him and he'll help you get that squared away. But we want to see more people than ever live out the command of Jesus to go and to the whole world and make disciples. And so I encourage you to engage that. It's going to be awesome. So let me talk to you a little bit about some financial stuff. Let's invite Scott Rhoda to the stage. Now, Scott's under the weather today. He's at about 40%, but here's the truth. Scott Rhoda at 40% is better than most people at 100%. And so... um, my wife wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> and so uh, first and second services agreed and kind of laughed, but third service is like, no, that's just not true, Scott. That's not true. No. Um, <laughs> They're good at 40. <laughs> and so, uh, hey, talk to us. This is 2016. Um, this gives you a snapshot of, of kind of uh, receipts in 2016 and kind of some, some breakdowns. Talk, Scott, talk to us about some of the high points. Well, this is uh, uh, for the 12 months into 2016, and you know, the number that just drops off the page to me is the giving number. Yep. Um, that is about a $900,000 increase from 2015, guys, which that's absolutely worthy of uh, Isn't that incredible? You know, massive celebration. So we were just shy of $2.5 million in Correct. receipts. Yeah, and I mean, what that indicates, it indicates a lot, uh, you know, to stuff to myself and Pastor Dave. But one of Pastor Dave's uh, state of gold in, in his vision when we cast it earlier, earlier in last year was you know, he really emphasized participation, guys, and that is evidence of that participation mm-hmm. and a very healthy metric for our church. So uh, a bunch of people that previously weren't giving have begun giving. Correct. Which is incredible. So, right. and then the, talk to us about kind of how that plays out. Well, you know, the next line is just a categorization of the very, uh, categorizing the various expenses that uh, the church uh, incurs from a general fund perspective. And you know, categorized in a way that is kind of activity-based where we can get a sense of 
you know, what the various, you know, missions and uh, ministries and just general costs, insurance and everything else that we have in our church. You know, after that is, you know, revenues and excess of expenditures, which uh, is the excess of the uh, tithing in them that comes in that, you know, basically I would call that profit, but in church it's revenue in excess of expenditures, which allows us to, you know, fully continue on in our capital campaign and the vision for the church as we continue to build. So roughly 800,000 of that was able to come forward to help us finish out stuff on this building and get ready to take great break, break ground Correct. on the next. Correct. Cool. Let's talk about um, our 2017 anticipated income. So... You know, as after the pledge drive, we were able to figure that we had about uh, $8.1 million in pledged and anticipated giving. Um, about 850000 of that did come in in 2017, leaving over the next two years the balance to come in. So that's our projection of what we believe will probably come in in 2016 and the balance 2017, although I will share with you guys, no one will be disappointed if I'm wrong about that and much more comes in quicker. So, <laughs> so three and a half million is our expected income in 2017. Let's go look at general fund 2017 kind of snapshot. You know, again, that's uh, really a, a reflection of how we're going to spend the money that uh, the congregation's given us. So this is general fund, not including stuff related to the building, not including our work outside of South Reno. Correct. Correct. The non-missional and non building related yep. uh, expenses again categorized in a very similar format as uh, as to what our actual numbers were from 2007 or 2016 excuse me and then as we go to work on the campus and we're expecting yeah we're expecting uh, in the uh, budget this year to generate about uh, 1.5 million dollars in excess cash flow added to the money, you know, the excess that we did in the previous take year. Take next steps on the campus. To take next steps on the campus. That's and then we right. talk about our work outside of South Reno. Yeah, one comment I do yeah. want to make, yeah. you know, guys, is when we're in this season, um, we're incredibly thankful for what, you know, God has done in the congregation, but we're in a time where consistency really matters. Mm -hmm. So intentionality and consistency Good. are really important. So we talk about making a difference outside of South Reno, a little bit over half a million, about 540, that way. Yes, we had, uh, in the vision you'd put out, Pastor Dave, we, anticipated, or we, we said we were going to spend about $850,000 of uh, the money that came in. It is front-end loaded this year, guys. As you can tell, we just spent $102,000 of, you know, what you had entrusted us with to build a church in uh, Bolivia. Mm -hmm. We're also uh, taking next steps very quickly in terms of the North Campus, as Midtown you talked campus. about earlier. Mm -hmm. So that number will balance out, you know, in the next, in the next 12 month cycle. So, we, so we are, we're being, you know, forward and moving forward on, the, on, that, on that line item this year. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And this is, this is a high-level snapshot. And uh, every year we say, hey, if, if you are a partner at Life Church, if you're investing generously at Life Church, Scott welcomes. If you have questions or, or want to follow up to get more detail, uh, Scott's more than happy to sit down with you and chat about that at any time. Um, and then so... Let me just give you a brief, about eight to nine minute brief message of why this all matters. So if you have your Bibles, go over to Acts chapter two. And so if you've been at Life Church any amount of time, um, you have seen once or twice a year, we'll come back to the passage of scripture in Acts chapter two, verse 42, which really gives a snapshot of what the very first church was like. And so for us, we, we see what this very first group of, of followers of Jesus, what their lives were like. And, and when, when, when we read that, we say, that's what we believe God's called us to be about at Life Church. And so what's happening here is, is it's just a few weeks after Jesus had died on the cross, risen from the dead, he's ascended into heaven. And then there's this holiday called Pentecost where people would come from all around the world to Jerusalem and, and celebrate this Jewish holiday. And it was on that day that Peter, was preaching and about and the Holy Spirit fell in power and about 3,000 people said what must we do to be saved 3,000 people came to faith and were baptized and yet the birth of the first church in Jerusalem and so let me show you this Acts chapter 2 verse 42 and what, and what I see when I read about this very first church is it, is it makes it crystal clear to me that the local church is the hope of the world and that when the local church is healthy, there's nothing more beautiful. And that when the local church is living up to its potential, there, there's nothing more powerful than the work of God through the local church on earth. And so let's see this. 
and these early Christians. It says, and they, these 3,000 new Jesus followers, they devoted themselves. This early church, they were devoted, they were committed. It, it, it speaks to me that for them, following Jesus and being a part of God's family wasn't some secondary piece of their life. It wasn't something that if they found the time for, they would do, but, but it was actually at the center of who they were. They were devoted, they were committed to Jesus and his church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And so they'd get together and the apostles would, would, would teach them the Old Testament. The apostles would talk about Jesus. The apostles would talk about what it looks like to follow Jesus. And, and, and they would learn about that. They were loving God with their minds. And so that apostles' teaching is what became our New Testament. And, and so for us at Life Church, we want to be, we're going to always come back to the Bible. What does God's word have to say? We want to love God with our minds. Uh, they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread. And so these people are regularly getting together. They're eating some food together. Uh, th th this would happen in, in small groups. This would happen with families. They're eating some food and they'd take some bread and they'd say, hey, guys, remember just a few months ago when Jesus said, hey, this bread, it's a picture of my body that I'm giving for you. And they'd take some wine and they'd say, hey, it was just a little bit ago that Jesus said, hey, this wine, it's a picture of my blood that's being shed for you. And so they would regularly focus on what Jesus had done for them. The fact that Jesus had died on the cross for their sins, that he'd risen from the dead, conquering sin and death and hell. They never lost sight of what Jesus had done. They were centered in on the gospel. And so for us at Life Church, we want to always come back, never allow ourselves to forget that the main thing is that God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die in our place, but that he didn't stay dead, but so that we could become his children. And so they were centered in on what Jesus had done for them to the breaking of bread and to prayer. This, this early church, they, they were a praying church. All they knew is that because of this relationship they had with Jesus, they had direct access to the father and that, that, that he, they could come and make requests and that they could speak to the father and the father could speak to them. They were a praying church church. And so that's part of what we're, we're wanting to take next steps in increasing that prayer culture this year at Life Church. And because of their prayer, there was, they were a church that experienced the tangible manifest presence of God. Let me show this to you. Verse 43 it says, and awe, that word, there's the Greek word phobos, where we get our word phobia, the idea of fear, not fear in a bad way, but there was this holy sense of fear, this sense that they would come together and they, and they, would, they would hear the gospel and, and they would take communion and they would pray pray. And there would be this sense that, that, that they'd say, wow, I know God's everywhere, but right now it seems like he's a little bit more here right now. This idea of this tangible manifest presence of God where you leave a place or you leave a people and you say, wow, I feel like I just experienced the presence of God in a powerful way. That's what was happening there. They were experiencing God's presence in a big way, but they were also seeing God's power in a big way. Let me show this to you. It says, and all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. As these guys were praying and, and, and they were experiencing God's presence, they were also seeing their prayers answered, that, that God was showing himself in power and lives were being changed and miracles were being done. They were experiencing God's presence and experiencing God's power. Let's keep reading. Verse 44, and all who believed were together. They were united. There was a unity and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Here's what was happening. These guys really loved each other. There was this whole other level of relationship. They recognized that Jesus didn't just die so they could have their sins forgiven and heaven for their home, but that Jesus died and rose from the dead so that they could be placed into a family, the family of God, and that, that, that they were brothers and sisters together. So here's what happened. There's all these people in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. They all come to faith. This epic, things this, the epic thing happens. And they say, man, I can't imagine going back to where I'm from because people were from all over, dozens or hundreds of miles away. They said, man, I can't imagine imagine going back quite yet because of what God's doing right here. And now I'm a part of this family. So I'm going to stick around for a while. But because of that, there was a bunch of people with nowhere to stay. 
And there was a bunch of people with no money because their jobs were back home. And there was a bunch of people that needed some food to eat. And so what happened is even though these people had just met each other just in the previous few weeks, they recognized that they were now a part of God's family. And so they began sharing. People began to sell stuff so that they could buy stuff for others and give money to others. And people were staying in each other's homes. They were feeding one another. It was this evidence that they really loved each other and they loved to be together. It said they would gather together day by day and the temple courts in large groups like we're doing here, but also in small groups like you would see in homes. They were just getting together. They loved to be together. So they'd come together and they would, they would be taught and they'd pray and they'd take communion and they'd worship and they would so enjoy just hanging out and living life together that, that, that they'd say, man, I can't imagine waiting until next Sunday to do this again. Let's get together tomorrow. They just loved to be together. This early church just so loved each other. It says, verse 47, they were praising God. They were worshiping Jesus. They'd gone from death to life. They'd gone from darkness to light. And so the only thing that made any sense at all was just to worship God. And so they just couldn't. It was just a natural response because of what God had done in their lives. They loved to worship. And they were having favor with all the people. Now, there's no doubt that through church history, there are seasons where the church would experience great persecution. Usually that happened at the hands of religious people or, or the government. But when it came to regular people, they, they, it says here they were having favor with all the people. See, what would happen is people w- w- would see these, these followers of Jesus and, and the ones that they'd known a while, they'd say, man, I, I, I know what you used to be like. You used to be the biggest jerk in this town. And now you're different. They'd say, man, you've always been the greediest person I ever knew. But now you're selling stuff to help poor people? What's happened to you? And they saw the way they loved each other and they saw the way that they helped the helpless and loved the unlovable and and met the needs of the least of these that the people around said, man, there's something special about those people. And so they began to enjoy the favor. There was this attractiveness. And then it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So what was happening is is they're looking at this guy and they said, man, you used to be the meanest guy I I knew. You were the biggest jerk in this town and now you're kind and loving. You used to have the worst temper and now you're gracious and forgiving. You used to be so stingy and now you're so generous. They say, what happened to you? And then the person would say, I'm glad you asked. I met this guy named Jesus. He died on the cross for me just a few months ago. And he rose from the dead. Have you heard about him? I can tell you about him. And then people would look at that person and say, man, you were the worst person I knew. If God could do that for you, I bet he could do it for me. And so then people were coming to faith day by day by day. I don't know about you, but when I read about this early church, I say, you know what? The local church is the hope of the world. And when it's at its best, there's nothing more beautiful. And when it's fulfilling its God-given potential, there's nothing more powerful. And so I don't know about you, but I'm pretty committed to saying, God, would you make us that kind of a church? Would you, would you create a holy discontent in us where we say, you know what? I'm not willing to settle for anything less than, than God beginning to do something like he did there in us more and more and more. That's what church is all about. It's not, it's not about how much money we bring in. I'm just telling you that because we figure some of you might want to know. It's about this stuff. It's about lives being changed forever. It's about people really loving God with their whole selves. It's about us really loving one another, recognizing that we really are brothers and sisters. We're the family of God. And so what belongs to me belongs to you. And what belongs to you belongs to me. And I'm just so glad you have a boat because I'm going to borrow it. That's what it means. And it's about people saying, you know what? We're going to love God. We're going to love each other. And and we're going to make a big difference with our lives because eternity is at stake. The kingdom's at stake. Let's pray. So, Father, God, I pray that, Lord, as we see what you've done in the past and people... 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. And we see these people that really loved you with their whole hearts and they really loved one another like family. That you really used them to make a difference. 
God, that there'd be something by, that, by your spirit that, that you would cause to grow in us where we say, God, would you do more and more and more of that stuff here? So God, we're so grateful for all that you've done these last 11 years. And God, we have a great heart of expectation of all that you're going to do this year and the years to come. Lord, that we would in increasing measure become the church you made us to be. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.